Hello, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. I'm a hands-on software architect and also the founder of developer2architect.com. In today's lesson number 107, I'll be showing you several annotations and attributes that I use within a microservices environment. Now, when I say an identity or custom identity annotation, uh, these sometimes are called tag annotations or marker annotations. And here's an example of one. In Java, and I'll show you the C-sharp in a little bit, but in Java, uh, we would create an interface here, framework. And notice this code actually does nothing. <laughs> However, it is useful in tagging or marking or showing the identity of a particular class. And so it provides this programmatic metadata. The same thing we have in C Sharp. However, we call them custom attributes instead. And the form is basically the same. We have a class framework here that extends system.attribute, which does absolutely nothing. But it does tag or mark certain classes with a particular identity or category. Let me show you four different annotations and attributes that I use within microservices. Now, for brevity's sake, I'm going to be showing you those annotations written in Java. But you can see clearly here the corresponding annotation in Java really is an attribute in C Sharp. Oh, the first one, which is the, kind of the, the most important necessary one uh, within using annotations within microservices, is that of a service entry point. In Lesson 28, I kind of introduced a couple of ways of designing a microservice. And one of the ways I showed within Lesson 28 was that use of microhexagonal architecture or design to produce a protocol agnostic processing kind of design for a microservice. And these classes that you see right here that I've kind of highlighted right here form uh, those kind of ports and adapters within, uh, inside a microservice. And that actually becomes uh, the entry point specifically. Uh, I usually denote the RESTful Access API uh, as the kind of entry point. In other words, this is the class that exposes all my RESTful endpoints uh, to our, our API gateway. Now, with here, uh, I would create a custom annotation or attribute. Notice here, I'm calling it service entry point. And on the class file that I denote as the entry point class, usually that API RESTful Access Facade class, um, notice I denote that with this annotation or custom attribute. Now, this does a couple of things. The primary use of the service entry point is to I have a placeholder for all other kinds of annotations or attributes that I'm going to be showing you. In other words, where do we put these things? I usually put them in the service entry point. Now, in the rare case where, or maybe you're using, for example, the direct access design that I show in Lesson 28, or you really don't have a definable entry point, in those cases, I will create a class file that does nothing <laughs> but is the same name as the service. And that I'll denote as the service entry point. And you'll see the use of that when we see other kinds of attributes. Uh, the other one I use that's very common is the service type. Now, in Lesson 33, I showed you a service taxonomy, all the various types of microservices you can have within a microservices ecosystem, whether they be functional infrastructure, orchestrators, aggregators, adapters, data services, etc. I indicated in Lesson 33 the importance and the types and the roles of these kind of services. But this is where I also use a custom annotation or attribute. And for example, to denote a functional service, I'll create a functional service annotation or attribute. And there, let's say on the payment service, for example, here's the service entry point notice. And now I can denote this as a functional service. Now again, Interestingly enough, this code actually does nothing. However, it does do a lot for us as developers and architects. As a developer, it gives me context into the type of service that I'm actually working on. In other words, is this an adapter that's going to an external system, or is this an orchestrator that's actually bringing information together? It gives me usefulness as an architect for governance. 
Uh, maybe I want to ensure that we don't have more than 10% of our services being orchestrators or no more than 5% being aggregators. This is an effective way of knowing how many orchestration services I actually have because I can simply programmatically count the number of services that have the orchestration service, for example, annotation on it. It also allows me as an architect to do all, all sorts of other governance as well. For example, uh, maybe orchestrators don't have data, are stateless. And so now I can denote programmatically that I have an orchestration service based on that annotation and also now perform various rules based on the restrictions of that service type. So it's very, very useful uh, for this particular annotation. And now here's all the various annotations you can uh, use to denote a service type. And you may have other types of services that you denote. And so here, I would have seven different annotations, each describing a particular service type. But I wanted to show you another technique you can use uh, within these custom annotations and attributes. And that is uh, to actually create a single annotation called service type, and then have an enumeration or an enum value as the single input listing all the various service types. So that, for example, with the payment service, I can still denote this as a functional service, but notice the service type now is generic and the input value specifies the type of service I now have. The choice of using either of these two options um, a lot of times comes down just simply to personal preference. I have found, and this is usually when I write fitness functions to govern different services based on these annotations or attributes, I find it a little easier uh, to look for a specific annotation or attribute, as opposed to look for the annotation and then the corresponding argument within it. Um, however, bo both are feasible. However, the time I do use this kind of technique you're seeing here is when a service can have multiple values for that particular context. And as a matter of fact, I'll show you one of those in a little bit. Another useful annotation I use continuously is a service domain. In Lesson 34, I kind of introduced the concept of service domains and the usefulness of these, not only for identifying maybe a, 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 a repo for your microservices, but also service owners and a way of logically grouping a collection of services together within a particular domain. Now, one of the things we can use, and I show this also in Lesson 34, is of course a custom attribute or annotation. Here I might define, for example, a customer domain annotation or a shipping domain annotation. And consequently, now I have a particular service. Notice the entry point. Notice I've got information now. It's a functional service and it belongs to the customer domain. This gives me information as a developer into the overall context of this, whether I should be responsible for this or not. Because if I'm part of the customer domain team and I'm modifying a service that's in the shipping domain, I probably shouldn't be modifying that. I should defer that to somebody in that particular domain. Um, but also, it allows me to run programmatic documentation, tools that I can write based on these annotations to say, show me a list of all the services in the customer domain. And those pop up programmatically as opposed to stale documentation in our wiki. Now, with the service domain, we can do the same kind of technique of actually creating a single annotation or attribute called service domain, as you see here, with a list of all the domains. And now, consequently, if I have a payment service API, I can still specify the service domain as a type. There's one other attribute I wanted to show you in this video, and that's the transactional saga for distributed transactions. In Lesson 53, I showed you transactional sagas and how they're used within uh, microservices to handle distributed transactions. In this case, where I place an order and I have to make a payment, uh, but it is a remote service. It spans multiple services, hence is a transactional saga. Not surprisingly, I use custom annotations and attributes for this as well. Now, in this case, I do use values for my saga, and I'll show you exactly why.
So here's my annotation, or again in C-sharp this would be the attribute. And notice it takes in one value, the actual transaction. Here I have one place where I'm actually listing all of the possible transactions we have in our system. And this is why I like this form of it, because notice the payment service API here, which is in the payment domain, which is a functional service, that's the entry point, is involved in two different transactional sagas. And so when I have those multiple values, this is when I use this form, where I have a single annotation or attribute and then the corresponding values. This gives me valuable information for several reasons. One, as a developer, if I'm working on this payment service, I now can restrict my testing scope because I know this is involved in the order placement saga and also order cancel. Another use of this annotation is to write tools to say, for example, programmatically, I'm working on the order placement transactional saga. What services are involved in that? And now I can code crawl, look for all services that have a saga annotation that says order placement and list those out to me. And so these are the usefulness of these custom annotations and attributes. Super easy to create and very, very powerful to convey metadata information or even to facilitate custom tooling for governance within your microservices ecosystem. So please stay tuned to developer2architect.com where there's lots of resources for you in this rather difficult transition from developer to architect and kind of learning about architecture and specifically Software Architecture Monday. We're on the lessons link under the menu. I mean, you can see all these free videos between five and 10 minutes describing some aspect of software architecture. So this has been Lesson 107, Microservices Annotations and Attributes. Thank you so much for listening and stay tuned in two weeks for my next lesson in software architecture. Thank you.